Hi! And I'm here to talk about the journal article written by Professor Doreen G. Fernandez entitled Philippine Popular Culture, Dimensions and Directions The State of Research in Philippine Popular Culture Popular culture can be defined as a set of practices, beliefs, and objects, or traditions, and material culture of a particular society. Examples of this are the cultural products such as music, art, literature, fashion, dance, Okay, you should just know that we don't do this a lot, so this is like a really huge deal. We want to invite you to have lunch with us every day for the rest of the week. Oh, it's okay. Coolness! So we'll see you tomorrow. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. Television. Finally! I've been trying to catch you boys all day! Now that I've got you right where I want you! I'd like to buy all your chocolate. Thank you for your patronage. And radio that are consumed by most society's population. Pero, teka lang. Let's go back in the 1980s. 1981 to be exact because this article was made in that year when the Philippines is still under martial law Fun fact! Or not so fun, but it is a fact On September 22, 1972 the late former president Ferdinand Marcos issued a letter of instruction number one authorizing the military to take over the assets of major media outlets nationwide like ABS-CBN Network Channel 5 and various radio stations across the country. Parkus justified the order by saying it is done to prevent the use of privately owned mass media against the government. Yikes, right? With that being said, let's now start this. Popular culture in the Philippines is a concern of recent awareness, recent exploration, and even more recent definition. It includes media objects, entertainment and leisure, fashion and trends, and linguistic conventions. Ano nga ba ang pop culture sa Pilipinas? A third world developing country with many indigenous ethnic groups still definitely unurbanized, with a long history of colonization that left behind cultural influences by the Spanish and the American. And we can also add the Chinese as well. Considering these things, the definition of what is popular in the Philippine context can be quite difficult. Mass media generated culture in the Philippines is what can be properly called popular culture. Ang mga pelikula, radyo, television, at ang print media sa Pilipinas ay makikita na sa simula pa lang ng 20th century. Pero dahil nga sa ekonomi ng bansa, ang mga urban areas o lungsod ang karamihan meron neto. Meron din naman sa rural areas o mga probinsya, pero hindi lahat ay meron sinihan, jaryo, at magazine. Radyo lang ang meron. Research in the field is very young. Having started out in the 60s as mass communications research, mass communication research 
concerned with the content and the effects on the audience is the earliest form of popular cultural research in the Philippines. In the mid-70s, the literature scholars began to examine films, televisions, radios, and comics as a mode of fiction and drama. The concerns in regards with this are what cultural values were being transmitted. How well was the transmission being done? To whom? With what effect? And to what purpose? This concern came from the recognition that serious literature, like the novel, the short story, the poem, the play, was not reaching the great majority, not even the urban masses, and certainly not the rural masses. And in 1972, under martial law, there were a few outlets for the short story and poem, and only one for the popular novel which is the Waiwai. Any literary product reaching the people was getting there through the media, and that reach, that power, needed to be studied, analyzed, and evaluated. And with that being said, Let's now go through each major area of the Philippine popular culture and briefly examine its history. Then after that, will be the state of research done in the field. And comics. The first Filipino comic strip was called Ken Koi, which first appeared in 1929. It was first consisted of four frames used as a filler in the popular weekly YY, but eventually grew to a full-page feature. By 1931, other comic strip characters joined the sleek-haired Kenkoi. Almost all of them modeled on American comic characters, like Kalafu, who roamed the mountains of Luzon as Tarzan did in Africa, Goyo and Kikai, local counterparts of Maggie and Jigs, and so on through the years and the changing fashions, to eventually include today's superheroes, horror stories, science fiction, magical creatures derived both from the lower Philippine mythology and from Western sources. Since 1972 and martial law, the comics have also been used by the government agencies to carry such developmental messages such as the Green Revolution, housing programs, and family planning. The content which are the dreams, the hopes, the values, the vision of life, the escape from reality, the problems and resolutions, the total worldview reflected in the comics, definitely makes the comics popular culture. It is not only the content that makes comics of the people. It is also the fact that they have such reach and grasp. Dr. Reyes sees the comics as having taken on different roles. Provider of entertainment and moral lessons and a disseminator of values and attitudes. And even a source of practical knowledge on farming, government policies, medicine, and science. Comics have been studied both from the mass communication and the literary cultural approaches in magazine and journal articles and in thesis. An early study was Karina Constantino David's The Changing Images of Heroes in Local Comic Books. 1974, Dr. Reyes' subsequent work is pioneering. Since although it occasionally uses literary norms and methods, it takes the comics as a phenomenon of popular culture. Next are the films. The first films shown in the Philippines were short features called Cinematographer. In 1909, two Americans, Hersley and Gross, produced the first two locally made feature films, both on the life of Jose Rizal. The first full-length feature film was Jose Nupung Senos, The Lagambukid, in 1919. In 1924, 
they were 214 movie houses all over the Philippines. By 1939, the Philippine movie industry was the fifth in the world in the number of movies produced. There were 345 sound theaters in the country and 11 movie companies with a paid-up capital of almost 430,000 pesos. Of the films that filled the movie houses, an average of 120 each year in the last five years are Filipino and the stars Dolphy, Vilma Santos, Nora Honor, and others who became folk heroes or in the current lingo, superstars. There are no film archives in the Philippines. No film libraries, even in the vaults of the former Big Four, Premier, Sampaguita, Lebran, and LVN Studios. And so the television run is of value for the film students or historian as being the living morgue of Filipino films that survive. The content of these films have been subject of much discussion and criticism, especially since 1976 when the year of the formation of the Mananuri ng Pelikulang Pilipino, the film's critic circle, composed mostly of film buffs and writers from the academe and journalism. Literature in the Filipino films includes five books, and none of them rule studies film as film, much less as popular culture. One claims to be history, one claims to be film stars, one is about censorship, one is largely pictorial memoir, and the fifth is film directory. A few scholarly studies are concerned with film history. Of special value is the work of scholars Nicanor Tiongson and Bienvenido Lumbera. Dr. Tiongson's From Stage to Screen examines folk drama as a source of the Filipino film and its four values in Filipino drama and film studies colonial values expressed in both media. Dr. Lumbera has written a paper on the difficulties of research on the Philippine film, citing the absence of film archives and the problems adhering to each of the periods of the development of the Philippine film. Next is the radio. In June 1922, three 50 watt stations owned and operated by an electrical supply company and organized by an American, Henry Herman, were given temporary permits to set up stations in Manila and Pasay. They were replaced by a 100 watt station, KZKZ, after two years of providing music for the few who owned sets. During the Japanese occupation, all radio stations are closed, except KZRH, which was renamed as PIAM. It is also now renamed as DZRH. Reception on shortwave was strictly forbidden, but many receiving set owners risked their lives to listen to the broadcast of the voice of Juan de la Cruz, the voice of freedom, and the voice of America. It was on these hidden radio sets that the underground newspaper depended heavily for the information on the war. At the end of the occupation in 1945, declared the real birth of Philippine radio. Within five years after the war, there were 30 operating stations. In 1961, the largest broadcasting chain in the Philippines began to be formed first as the Bolinao Electronics Corporation, which then became the Alto Broadcasting System, then the Chronicle Broadcasting Network, which after martial law became the Kanlaon Broadcasting Station. DZRH initiated the first successful local shows, and Republic Broadcasting Systems, DZWB, become famous for on-the-spot news coverage. 
from those early days and past landmarks, the formula of the Philippine Radio was developed. It consists of a maximum of soap opera, a quantity of MC popular music programs, public service and advice to the love lorn programs, and news. With a few different shows like developmental program being at Farmers, Balagtasan for the Tagalog regions, Composo for the Ilonggo regions, religious programs, and very occasionally classical music. It was obvious that radios were in urban centers. The reach of radio changed in 1959 with the transistor revolution. Former President Carlos P. Garcia asked CARE to donate a few thousand transistor radios for the barrios explaining that this would combat subversive elements in the rural areas, most of which did not and still do not have electricity. In barrios, where the method of spreading and getting information was by word of mouth, the transistor radio became a towering presence, bringing news of the government and of the city and its problems, infusing pop music into the domain of condiman, spreading of popular culture beyond the urban sprawl and into the rural folk realm. The two principal forms of popular culture conveyed by radio are popular and the radio soap opera. Both have been studied in different ways by mass communication researchers, principally through content analysis and surveys determining the effects on the attitudes of the listeners. The two principal writers who have used other approaches are Virgilio V. Vitug, who is a poet and a journalist, takes a historical critical approach, and Jose Javier Reyes, who takes a semi literary approach. Vitug calls the radio soap opera a paprika ng luha at pantasya, that they should awake to the responsibility to make a radio drama an instrument for awareness and education, and thus a spring of information and truth. Reyes studies the feeble roles in dramas, the expected and the unrelenting martyrdom that makes the heroines dominant over the males, and that causes tears to fall and ask, is this reflected reality? The authentic lot of women in semi-feudal Philippine society or is it instead a source of an idea that has been successfully implanted through all these years?